I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Well, one of my newest inspirations, a great illuminator, is our puppy, a little labradoodle. Well, he's quite big now, actually. Oban, Oban the Illuminator. How many of you have had the experience of owning a dog? How many? Quite a few, quite a few. So I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, as it were. Well, it sure is a big responsibility, isn't it? Not the kind of thing you should rush into. In fact, we decided to try having children first, you know, just to see how things would go. We wouldn't want to rush into such a commitment as, as owning a dog. But in all seriousness, I, I am actually a new dog owner, and it's a bit of a steep learning curve. The chewed up toys, television converters, the barking, the odors, the occasional decoration left lying about, thankfully now always outside. But one thing that is always striking that I'm sure you can relate to is when I come home. No matter how rough of a day, even if I left shouting at him for chewing up my favorite pair of shoes, as soon as I walk up the steps to the front door, he comes barreling down the hall and the stairs and jumps into my arms with no consideration of his muddy paws and my, my fine clothes. He's overwhelmed with excitement dancing in circles, licking, grunting, shaking his behind, bursting with joy after being reunited, after a long day apart. In that moment, there is nothing in the universe for my dog than me. I think maybe those of you who have had a dog know what I'm talking about. Or maybe you know the feeling of falling in love. When every flower breathes his name or her name. You can't even think anymore. The yearning, the wound of love. How can we speak of such experience, the longing for wholeness, for return, for consummation, for communion? And these are experiences, I think, that point to our relationship with God and even more so God's longing for us. That's how we describe God as best as we can in our tradition. God as relationship. That's what the life of the Trinity is, after all. A circle of self-giving relationship. Wholeness found in pouring oneself out for the other. That's how God reveals himself to us as Christ Jesus. As one who pours himself out on the cross. A great act of self-dispossession. See, God aches and he yearns for us more than we could imagine. And made in his image, he yearns for his children and he waits and he waits with great anticipation for those who have parted to come home. In our Western tradition, through especially the medieval period and with the help of the reformers of the 16th century, we've come to place a strong emphasis on a particular interpretation of the relationship of God and human beings, an interpretation forged within a feudal society, a feudal worldview. You may know it as penal substitution theory or atonement theology. It's the language that delights 
in invoking images of our wormness. It tells us that we humans are bad, dirty, worthy and deserving of punishment, guilty. The story that is told is one whereby an exchange takes place, a payment for our guilt at the sacrifice of the cross. Like a feudal lord and a guilty serf, our ransom is paid by the Lord's Son. Sound familiar? Well, friends, that's only one vision. That's only one particular narrow vision that captured the imagination of people. And I don't believe that that is consistent with the scriptural witness or to the tradition of the fathers of the church. And I can't preach that vision because it does not line up to my experience of ultimate reality, which is one of a loving God. Let's recall just for a moment some of a couple of the words we heard in our readings today, the word of sin and repentance. Sin means to miss the mark, literally, that's what it means, to miss the mark, to fall short of our intention, to lose the thread of our true end, to fall out of relationship with the source of life. In essence, choosing death over life. That's what the word sin means. Sin is our wandering from the font, the path of the baptized. And sin has consequences, not punishments. Not punishments, consequences. If I shoot a hole in my boat and I sink, I'm not being punished. I'm facing the consequences of shooting a hole in my boat. Repentance, the Greek word for repentance, any Greek scholars, is metanoia, metanoia. And what metanoia means, literally, is to turn around, to return to the path, to capture the thread of our true intention, our true aim. Repentance is returning to right relationship with life, the source and grounding of our very being, which is nothing other than God. St. John of the Cross says, the center of the soul is God. Repentance is to return, indeed, to the font, the primary relationship that gives us our being in every moment. And though certainly it is helpful, it is helpful to be mindful when we lose our way, when we miss the mark, to repent, to return, to turn around. But it is not helpful, I don't think, to gloat or indulge in feelings of guilt or shame or self-depreciation and to moralize and constantly judge our worthiness before God, our Creator, as if we could somehow improve our worth by our heroic piety. We simply cannot. God loves you because you are you. Because he knit you in your mother's womb and he calls you by name and he calls you beloved of God. The gospel tells us of God's great love for all God's children, especially those who have strayed. And he weeps for us and the consequences that we face by our waywardness. He weeps and he waits and he bears the wound of love. And he comes barreling down the hall and bursts into our arms, muddy paws and all, when we come home at the end of a long day of being parted from him. 
chases us not with a stick, but with his open arms to embrace you. And as the church, we gather at this table to keep telling the story, to keep telling the story how he gives up his life for all his children, especially those who've lost their way, to tell even a sinner like me, you are beloved. Well, I told you last week, you may recall, that I was going to share with you today the only homily I am ever going to preach. In fact, if you get it, if you get it this time, there's really no sense, and you can skip the homily if you like. Uh, And this homily is to show you the face of Christ, to show you the face of Christ, the true Christ. So I have here a picture, and I'm going to carry it around. And I'm going to invite you all to gaze deeply into the face of Christ. Are you ready? Okay. Christ, in you, the hope of glory. Ephesians 3.16, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the profound mystery, this great pilgrimage that we are on to find God, to return to wholeness, to know the very ground of our being, a being so great and vast it is beyond anything I can ask or imagine, and so close it is more inward than my own breath, my own consciousness. And this is how God reveals himself to us, as one of us, and so all of us.
When we come to this table, friends, to receive God's life, we're not just sharing a friendly memorial, but we are consenting and yielding and saying amen. We are dying to death itself, saying yes to life, saying, yes, Lord, I am your beloved. And until I can confess that I am beloved of God, that God dwells in me, I cannot know God. And until I can say God and see God dwelling in my neighbor, I cannot know God. And until I can see God in my enemy, even the one who would strike me, even the one who would fly planes into the Twin Towers, I cannot know God. So that is my one homily, friends, and my job here among you to gather us at the table to tell the story and to show you the face of Christ and to lead you to a life of turning around, returning to that font, to the door where he is waiting and thirsting and hungering to love you and give himself to you. where he stands barreling down the hall already to jump into your arms. And I need you, because I need you to lead me back to the font too when I lose my way. I need you to help me know I am beloved. We need to help each other, and especially all those people who aren't here. <laughs>